Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everybody. I apologize sincerely for the delay if you have been waiting for us to come on live. Quiz isn't actually in the studio at the moment, and I had a little bit of difficulty logging on as the host. So um, welcome to everybody. Welcome to those of you who are listening live and those of you who are in the chat room. I can see you all there, and I'll say hi to you in a minute. And welcome indeed to those of you who are listening in the archive. Um, this show is coming from Mount Shasta, and as soon as Chrism arrives, um, he will come on and will begin to um, talk to you from there. Um, perhaps I'll begin by just saying a little bit about Mount Shasta. I have been actually very blessed myself in that I have visited Mount Shasta during one of my stays um, in California at the ashram with Chrism. I traveled there with him and with a group of other Kundalini people and it was a most wonderful experience. And I'll talk about that in a little while and maybe if anybody is listening that has been to Shasta and would like to talk about that. I know Eileen was there with me and she might uh, ring in. And I believe Sadvi was there as well, and she might like to ring in as well and speak about her experience there. But let's just tell you a little bit about Mount Shasta. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful mountain, and it is in the northern part of California, and it's very near the Oregon border. And it is actually, what you can see is the cone of an extinct volcano, and it is 15 or 16,000 feet above sea level. Um, and it's one of the biggest continental peaks in our largest volcano peaks in um, the United States. So Mount Shasta is known as a very special place. It's a very sacred space, and it's much more than just a mountain. It's considered one of the most sacred places on this planet. And I don't really know the whole history of Mount Shasta, but when you go there, you can really get a feeling and you become aware that there is something very mystical about this place and that it is a very mystical place in our world. Um, I'll maybe talk about that again after a while, but just to begin, as I usually do, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about um, the seminars. I'm also stalling and the whole chrism will arrive before I'm finished. <laughs> so um, let me just tell you a little bit about seminars that we are organizing. At this moment in time, we know that there are three going to be given. Three Kundalini Awakening seminars are going to be happening in 2014 at this particular point in time. One of them is happening in September, and Rosemary is organizing that. And that one is going to be held in Minnesota at the end of September. And if Rory comes on later, I will let her give you more details about that. But happening a lot sooner, there are two seminars in March. The first one is happening on the East Coast and will be in New York. Now, definitely next week, I'm hoping to be able to give you the actual uh, venue for it or the, uh, more precisely what part of New York it's going to be held in but it is definitely going to be organized in New York. The dates are set and these are not going to be changed so that will be on March the 22nd and March the 23rd which is a Saturday and a Sunday and the seminars run for two days. They begin at 9 in the morning and they finish at 5 p.m. each day. So there's a lot packed into those two days. It is a wonderful opportunity for those of you living on the East Coast to come and meet other Kundalini people and to, be, to spend some time with Kundalini people and also to come and hear Chrism speak about the, the Kundalini. And he is fantastic. It is a wonderful experience to actually come and hear him talk about the Kundalini and to share those two days with people who are on the same path as you. If you're actually Kundalini Awakened or Awakening, these seminars are so beneficial. I cannot tell you how wonderful it is to attend one of them. And if you're listening and you're interested in a Kundalini Awakening, but as yet that has occurred for you, well then you are also most welcome because um, Chrism is very much dedicated to the safe and joyful activation and awakening of the Kundalini energies. And not only will you... Um, 
you know, come to know a lot about Kundalini in those two days, but Chrism also offers Shakti Pat on the second of the days, on the um, on the Sunday. And there is always follow through and support that continues way after the seminars are over. And there's often a little community um, formed between the people who attend the seminars. So that's the New York seminar, March the 22nd and March the 23rd. And also then Chrism is coming to Ireland directly from New York and there's going to be another seminar there in Newgrange in County Meath in Ireland. Now this is actually a European seminar um, even though it's in Ireland because Ireland is obviously part of Europe but it is a very easy destination to get to from all parts of Europe and um, a very short flight and Ryanair is an airline that offers Dublin as a destination for most, most places in Europe. And you can actually fly to Ireland, to Dublin, for anything between 30 and 50 euros for the whole return trip, um, which is excellent value. And I'm including the United Kingdom as well in that. So that seminar is happening on March the 29th and the 30th. And again, it's a two-day seminar from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Newgrange is a very beautiful place, excuse me, to have the seminar in. It's a very ancient, megalithic site. And the last time we had the seminar there in October, we actually went as a group and visited Newgrange and had a most wonderful Kundalini experience there. And so as far as I know, Chrism is intending to perhaps do that again during this seminar. Um, just to let those of you that are listening know, it might not be in the same location, in the same venue as it was the last time. But I have another beautiful venue lined up. And this one actually will have um, excellent benefits. But I'm, I'm going to keep that a surprise for those of you who are attending. Um, do get in touch with me if you're interested. If you're living in Europe and you're interested, I can certainly help you with flights. And you will be collected from Dublin Airport and driven to the seminar. It's only a 30-minute journey. So um, that's, that's uh, another great thing about where it's going to be located. So please do get in contact with me. My email address is kundalinimatters at gmail.com. And this is actually, um, uh, what would you say, um, my Gmail account. There's no point in... I suppose I can give also my uh, phone number for those of you who might like to phone me about it. Uh, 00353-860297676. And if you want to write kundalini matters at gmail.com. Okay, so the other thing I'd like to speak with you about before returning to um, talk about Mount Shasta, and Eileen, if you're there, I'd um, welcome you to call in, please, if you're listening. I don't know who you actually are. I'm having a look in the chat room now, and I think a few people have logged out because of the delay, but I can see Julie is there and Andrew is there. I know that sometimes Eileen has difficulty getting into the chat room, but if you're listening on your PC, Eileen, I would appreciate a call in and maybe we could share with the listeners our experience of being, oh, there's somebody there now. I will go check that in a minute. Listener, if you'll just hold on, I'll be with you in a couple of minutes. I want to just tell you also about where you can make a donation if you want to support Chrism in the work that he does. As you all know, Chrism um, works full-time with Kundalini Awakening Systems. He works in so many different venues. Um, gee, to even list them would be amazing, and I'm, I'm not going to actually do that now. But he works 24-7 at this job, and in order um, to do the things that we all do and pay the bills and all that sort of thing that are necessary to pay, he is dependent on the donations, so all donations are most gratefully received. So what you can do if you're in a position to donate and if you feel you want to donate, you go to this address. It's www.ascension-kundalini.blogspot.com. And on the right-hand side, you will see a donate button. 
and you can donate there. Um, again, there is absolutely no requirement to do this, but if you wish to do so, it will be indeed gratefully received. I'm going to go now into the studio, and perhaps this is Eileen. Let's see. Hello, listener. Hi. Is that Eileen? Hi. Yes, hi. Hi, I'm here. Can, you can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I can hear you as well. I can hear you as well. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> okay. I was reading. I was reading up on Mount Shasta and the the hot springs we went to. Okay, I can't remember what it was called, Eileen. I just remember there was a red river and a blue river. It's called the Stewart Mineral Springs, and you're right. There were two, there are actually those two rivers, and then there's a, another river that they flow together, the three of them, to to yes. become the hot springs. They do, they do. Well, Eileen and myself, um, listeners, went there exactly this time two years ago, actually. It was in January, Eileen, wasn't it? Yes, yes. And it, yes. Was, it, it was very, very cold. Um, there was snow, <laughs> um, not just in the mountains, but on the roads as we traveled along. And when we arrived into the hot springs, let, let's say a little bit about the hot springs themselves. And this is just one particular aspect um, of Mount Shasta, and um, there is so much to see in Mount Shasta, but maybe we could talk about this for a little while, Eileen. Do you want to say something yourself about, maybe describe it or, or just share something about it? Uh, okay. Um, I had never, well, I had only been to a hot springs one other time, and this one was totally different. Uh, they have a beautiful piece of property, and they do have... Um, they have a retreat, retreat areas that could be um, used as accommodations for personal retreats or group retreats. And then they have a bathhouse, and the bathhouse is where we spend the majority of our time. And it was, um, it was just very interesting, the procedure that we did. And, of course, being with the other Kundalini-activated people, that makes it a whole different <laughs> experience. Uh -huh. um, but... Basically, there are different parts you, you, different parts to the, the procedure, and it's they try to keep the place uh, very um, quiet, and it felt very almost like a church experience to me. That's how it felt, and going from one, uh, you know, from the bath into the hot the hot water, I mean the hot water, the cold water rinse, then into the uh, river, which was. <laughs> an experience in and of itself, if you remember. Um, I do indeed, I mean. <laughs> Well, and I want to say a little bit about that, but, I, but you go from the personal soaking in the mineral waters, and then you rinse off, and then we went, then we did, did we go to the water then, and then we came back and went to the, um, uh, what's it the called? Sauna? The, the sauna. The sauna. That's right. The mineral waters actually are, I mean, it's actually a bath. I mean, it's, right. it's like a big cast iron bath, and it's filled with extremely hot water. And up over it, there is like a chain that you hang on to that you can get yourself in and out of, um, of the bath. And it is extremely thick, isn't it, Eileen, the water, because That's of the minerals. Heavy. It's yeah, very heavy. Can, you can, and you can feel it, you know, you can feel the action of it upon your skin. And then you get out, and, you know, there, it's a really strange sensation, isn't it, on the skin, and you move out then into the outdoor area, or at least that's what we did. And um, it was well below zero, remember, Eileen? Oh, I do, yes, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the... When we got out there, there was, um, I think we might have spoken about this before, there was thick ice on top of this little, it's not a lake, it is like a plunge pool, but it is, what is it, like a mini lake? Um, uh, um, yeah, there, or a pond, I'd say a pond, pond surrounded by rocks, and the rocks That's were very slippery, I thought. <laughs> they had moss on them. But we had to break, um, I remember breaking the ice 
and actually yes. pushing it out of, yes. of the way and going into the, into the freezing cold water. And um, the interesting thing is, I mean, it was amazing, really, but the interesting thing is how the kundalini allows the body and warms the body in such a way that it can be quite well tolerated, can't it, Eileen? Uh, it, well, I think you tolerated it a little bit more than I did, but I remember what I enjoyed the most. We did it twice. We we did the sessions twice together, you and I, and holding hands and and oming, and that was that's the only way I could have stayed in the water. Now, <laughs> you, and I will, and I remember that. Um, didn't we go there two days? I think we went there two days because it was the second day that you broke the sick ice. The first That's day right. the gentleman broke it. The second day you broke that really thick ice, and you were in there. You and Chrism were in there for a long time, um, and that water was cold. But it was true. It didn't. Um, it was cold getting in, but then it felt so good. <laughs> it did. Um, it did. And, and then afterwards, um, we would go into the saunas, and there's a huge yeah. sauna there, and we would meditate in the saunas. Um, and this whole thing, even though we're, you know, we're laughing and joking about it, was actually very, like a ceremony, wasn't it, Eileen? It was. I mean, it, was. It, it, it was. It, I was just going to say, Chrism had us do the, the routine three times. Um, because of the significance of the three. And yeah, so we yeah. each did it. We went through the um, kind of a the ritual three different, three yeah. times. Um, and it was just re- it was just really nice. And it was winter. It was winter when we were there. So the other uh, areas of the venue were not open, but they actually do have a, like a coffee house that sometimes people will go to the spa and they go over to the coffee house. They do offer at times a sweat lodge, and um, they just they have a lot of events, different events there. So that was that. You're right. The hot springs was just one aspect of um, it was. The and do you remember, I have something that's just come back to me, Eileen, actually, and in the context of kundalini and healing, this is an interesting story, and I'm going to, uh, we haven't spoken about this since, so it will be interesting to see if you remember. When we came, as we came back into the, um, the house, we'll call it, or, or the retreat house, there was an area where people sat looking out. It was raised up sort of on stilts, let's say, and you could look out over the scenery, but there was in that place a stove burning. Yes. And we would oh, stand yes. there with our with our towels and chat and th- before we would go back in to have our second bath or our third one, whichever. And we were standing there and I had my back to the hot burning stove. Well, do you remember, I remember. this? <laughs> I remember, <laughs> when the, yeah. When the next thing, my leg burned almost stuck to the stove i was i had no feeling in my in my legs and i didn't feel it burn and i moved out of the way i actually heard it almost before i saw before i felt it (laughs) and do you remember that and i i I immediately um went in to my kundalini and asked for healing and just stood there you know in complete surrender to the healing that might be given to me. And there was absolutely no pain, no pain whatsoever. And I never blistered. Now, there was a mark there. Mm -hmm. It was like um, almost like a triangle shape for quite a while. But it it was like it wasn't seared. My my leg should have been seared, Eileen, shouldn't it? Right. Because it was... Yeah. Yeah. It was actually on the stove for quite a while. So that is just an example of kundalini healing that was given at that particular time, and I really did not injure my leg at all, which was quite amazing. Yeah, I, right. I do remember that. Yeah. 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 It was well. And do you remember the other thing that we did? I don't know if I should mention this. Um, we did the ritual of the baptism. Do you remember that with the group? 
I do. I do indeed. Um, well, maybe we yeah. won't. Oh, there's somebody else calling. Shall I go? Okay. Hold on, I mean, and I'll yes. see who it yes. is. Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm hitting it now. Hello. Hi, caller. Is that Chris? Oh, hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. No. <laughs> Can you hear well, me all right? Yes. Yeah, I can, yes. I can't call in. Evidently, they're, they're, they only let uh, one host in at a time, so I'm not. I'm that's, on a cell phone right now. Yeah, that's what happened and what delayed me, Chris. I wasn't able to come on unless I came on as host, so I was scrambling for the pin, which I don't normally use. So I was a little bit late starting, but we're on now. Are you... Um, are you going to be able to stay on the cell phone or? I don't know. Hello? Okay. Hello? Yeah, okay. Anyway, so so I heard you talking about healing. Yes, I was. Um, what we've done is um, I just spoke a little bit about Mount Shasta. Eileen came on and we spoke a little bit about our experience there at the springs and I was telling people about the time that we came in and I was standing by that hot stove and my leg stuck to the um, hot burning stove but I was given instant healing by the Kundalini and I was just I was just sharing of that of that and we were telling them about the ice and the heat in the body and and that sort of thing so I'm delighted you're here Chris (laughs) so I don't feel like I'm officially here. It's, it's kind of feels like I'm on. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is that is that we, happening? Yes, we can hear you okay, and you're officially here. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, yeah, yeah. The uh, the place we're going to, uh, I forget the name of it, uh, but it uh, it um, stand by a moment. Stuart Mineral Springs, if you're speaking of the same place. Yeah, that's the one. Stuart Mineral Springs. And uh, just trying to get a little situated here. So, yeah, they have a, they have a, a, a mineral uh, water recipe that they, that they put together that, that seems to be very, very conducive to to people receiving healing. Um, uh, they have a stream that is called the Shakti Stream. It's a little creek. And they have another little creek that's called the Shiva Creek. And the Shakti and the Shiva Creeks come together where you and Eileen were, were in that water at that time. Now, mm-hmm. up here right now, because because California is having such a drought, uh, there is no snow except as you as you come up to Mount Shasta. Mount Shasta has some snow uh, in it, but uh, and on it, but uh, it's not a very snowy environment now. Although I think it's getting very cold uh, in the daytime. And uh, Rosemary's stepping okay. into the. That's different to when I was there two years ago then. <laughs> right. Um, Chris, yeah. I was I was saying that um Mount Shasta is a very special place and that it's a sacred space, a sacred place. But I know very little about why that is so. I mean I was very aware of how mystical it felt and I could feel it. But I know that there are um you know, I know that the Indians, there were many nations living there. I know that there's some connection to Atlantis. Um, I know that it's considered one of the most sacred places on the planet, but I know little about why. Would you be able to say something about that aspect? Yeah. Uh, did you tell them about Kalos and all that? No, I'm not aware of that, you see, Chris. I'm not really. It isn't common knowledge. Stand by. Okay. So Rosemary's 
graciously letting me use her phone. Thank you, Rosemary. You are welcome. <laughs> Good to hear you. Can I just ask you while you're there, what are the dates for the seminar in September, Rosemary? I wasn't sure of them. September 27th and 28th, Saturday and Sunday. Okay, and maybe later on you could give an email address that people could write to, will you? Before sure. we close. Okay, great. Thanks, Rosemary. Okay. Um, so you're talking about the Atlantean connection. Well, there's a lot of connections, and we're just discovering uh, some of these connections right now uh, just by virtue of some of the, uh, the the abilities that our technology has has, has demonstrated, um, they're finding another huge underwater pyramid system off the coast of the uh, Canary Islands, uh, right off of Portugal. I think those are the Canary Islands that are right off of Portugal. There, uh, there's another huge step pyramid down there. And once again, this is this is uh, left over from uh, Atlantean Lemurian times. Now, with the coast of California, with the coast of California down around the Santa Barbara area, uh, some of the ancient texts indicate that that California's uh, Channel Islands are part of the the Lemurian continent that went down where uh, the uh, the island of Hawaii would have been the tallest mountain on that continent. And right now, uh, we, we all know of Hawaii just being a string of islands out there in the middle of the Pacific. But it, at one time, was part of a, of a larger uh, continent of which uh, Mount Shasta is also connected. Now, you know, you get a lot of... Yeah. I, I, because you can't see the studio, I want you to know that I'm going off now to speak with um, somebody who's calling in. So please keep call, talking until I come back. Oh, I can't you. hear yes. you once I do that. Okay. Will do. Will do. Uh, hello, everyone. So, you know, you get a lot of stories about Mount Shasta. Now, some of them are true. Some of them... I have experienced directly. Uh, when I was 26 years old last year, kidding, 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 kidding. <laughs> when I was 26 years old, I decided I was going to climb Mount Shasta, and I took all the wrong things with me. I took a lot of heavy photographic equipment. I, I took hardly any water. <laughs> Just, I made as many mistakes as you could possibly make with regards to uh, setting out on an on an expedition to to climb you know one of the tallest peaks on the west coast, but I did and and I didn't climb it. I, I wasn't I I didn't know that I needed crampons, which are uh, little uh, they 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 fit over your shoes and they allow you to walk in you know on a glacier or in snow. Uh, kind of gives you spiky shoes and and anyway, so I only got up to about the ten thousand foot level and. And uh, so I decided to set up my camp there, and there was a a little uh, enclosure there with the rocks that was open to the sky, and I thought, well, what a perfect place. So I camped out there. I didn't light a fire. I just laid the sleeping bag down, and I started kind of telepathically sending to uh, to whatever ET or entities might be out there. And you have to remember, at this time, uh, I had not had the second awakening of, of the Kundalini for this body. I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that type of, uh, of a situation with me. Anyway, so I went up there and I'm like telepathically sending to these to, to whatever. And uh, finally, you know, at around three, a little bit past three in the morning, I, I'm speculating here. I, I dozed off and I went to sleep. And I woke up and. Actually, a chipmunk uh, decided to do a swan dive onto my sleeping bag, and I kind of woke up with a start of a chipmunk uh, running across my face. Uh, my face was covered by the sleeping bag. And, um, and I made my way down 
the uh, mountainside, and uh, I find I went to a cafe uh, where I read a newspaper that was showing me that there were indeed lights uh, flying around the mountain when I was up there. And these reports came from uh, reliable sources like the sheriff's department or the highway patrol. You know, the highway patrol, and they have a big station over here, and, and they reported it as well. And they called it in to the local newspaper, which is what I was reading as I was down there at the cafe. Uh, so I never got to see them. But other people did. And so, you know, I don't know uh, whether they actually made contact with me or not. If they did, you know, maybe they put some sort of a memory block on Or maybe they saw the Kundalini signature in me, and maybe that was something that they weren't really interested in partaking of. Or maybe that was something that they, you know, for some whatever reason, you know, they, they, they would not have uh, wanted to communicate. Or if they did communicate, you know, they put a memory block in so that I wouldn't be, remember it, and it wouldn't affect my path. So uh, I have had others ex- other experiences uh, with regards to the mountain. Um, I've talked with people that that have seen these uh, figures coming out from the east side of the mountain here. Uh, and I say here because I'm literally here at the base of the mountain. Uh, and they come from the east side. Evidently there are caves that extend into the mountain and uh, to some people, and there's a city under Mount Shasta that's called Talos, T-E-L-O-S. And evidently, uh, there's a quite a large population of uh, life forms down there. I'm not sure what to call them. Uh, but you'll get these these people in white robes coming out of the east side of the mountain and they'll come into the city of Mount Shasta and they'll have gold nuggets or some sort of raw gold type of situation where they'll go straight to the assayer's office and they'll, you know, they'll bring their, their little gold nuggets into there and they'll uh, get cash for that and then they'll come around the, around the little town here and they'll buy certain things and then they'll disappear back into the east side of the mountain. And, uh, you know, so I talk to them, and, and, and they get a lot of folks that are just, uh, you know, they want to they wanna debunk it or they want to prove it. Uh, most of the people around here just kind of go with the flow of life uh, as their life is leading them. You don't... You have a lot of new age activities up here. There's a lot of, uh, uh, because the mountain has has a, a supernatural effect on, on many people, the Indians in this area, you know, basically reporting the same things that other people these, these days are reporting. So this mountain has had a very mystical effect and a very... Uh, from that mystical effect, you know, it's drawn a lot of people. And some of these people here are, are very much into the New Age thing. They they set up uh, this idea of, uh, I'm trying to remember, this guy named Dr. J- Joshua David Stone. Uh, he set up a school here where... Um, what I think they're calling Masters of the Divine Ray or the Divine Light, you know, and these are all channeled entities, so you know that I don't trust it for anything. I mean, you know, I wouldn't trust (laughs) it for a bottle cap. Uh, But uh, so, so there's this big organization that brings in a lot of money from a lot of people who want to make contact with the Masters of the Divine whatever. And you know, of course, you have uh, you have these these figures of history 
that are being represented as a master of a certain frequency of light. Uh, you have... Um, uh, <laughs> geez, please. Uh, so you got a bunch of people that were historically known to be um, figures that had a an idea or an understanding of paranormal activity and how to generate paranormal activity. Uh, I think there's around 12 or 13 of them, these masters, and and uh, I don't buy into any of it, folks. This is just me. This is just me and my Kundalini. And I think it's just giving people permission to find a, a belief system that is different than Christianity, different than, than Islam, different than Buddhism, different than, uh, than many of the, uh, of the current uh, religious models that are, that are you know, practiced by millions of people right now. Well, these people don't necessarily buy into any of that. And they, they want something that caters more to their wants and desires and, and uh, understanding in a linear sense. And so you know they wouldn't like Kundalini because Kundalini is not so linear. Uh, and so, yeah, so there's that big organization up here. You have some uh, shamans in this area that are very, very uh, uh, active in, in uh, you know, doing uh, uh, soul reconstruction or um, getting into the, uh, to, to what a lot of the Indians were practicing here. You know, before the the the, uh, the Europeans showed up, and so there's a there's a lot of spiritualistic belief systems and practices being held here. And as we go to Stewart's Hot Springs tomorrow, because tomorrow is Thursday and that half price day. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> yes, half price day. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so yeah, it uh, bring about, you know, the last time I was there with you, Amelia, I mean, there were some teepees going up. Remember that? There are teepees going up, and, and there are people there that are doing this sweat lodge ceremony and all of this thing. A sweat lodge ceremony is a, is a Native American ceremony where people go into a hot teepee, and it's kept hot with, uh, with, uh, with, with really hot river rocks going in there and then uh, they'll pour steam on them or something like that or just leave it hot and and anyway uh, we weren't partaking of that but we were partaking of the cold it was the cold that I wanted the kundalini people to feel I wanted them to immerse themselves in the cold and feel the kundalini warm them you know that's a that's a that's a fairly easy thing for a person to do that's kind of to kind of see where their body is with regards to the infusion of the kundalini. Here in Shasta, of course, you've got some very, very, very cold water, as, uh, as Amelia and Eileen uh, uh, experienced with regards to, uh, to uh, Stewart's Hot Springs. I recommend people come to the hot springs here, the Stewart's Hot Springs, and, and it's more of a mineral water. They heat the water themselves. This isn't coming from the volcanics at all. This is coming... The, the, the water itself has a very, very high, very, very healthy blend of minerals in it. And when you go into, they give you this, they give you a private bathtub and a, you know, and a hot and a cold spigot there, and they, they let you know that the hot's really hot. You want to be careful with that. Well, when you get into the water, you'll, it, it, it it's, if you've ever bathed with baking soda, it's very much a, like kind of a. <laughs> I hate to use the word, but it's kind of like a slime that that develops on your skin, and it makes it very slippery and very uh, very noticeable. You notice this this the new slippery uh, surface of your skin, and then you know you sit you you you're laying in there for about eight or nine minutes, whatever you feel like, and then you get up and you go into a Swedish uh, um, uh, sauna. And then you stay in the sauna for as long as you feel is necessary. And then you come outside and, and you either jump in or you, or you just slowly walk into this very, very cold water that's literally, you know, freezing on the surface and, and still running, you know, below the surface. And so 
you know, there's a your your uh, your skin will get a workout with regards to uh, the the opening and the closing of your of your skin cells with regards to the heat and the cold, the heat and the cold, the heat and the cold, and this is uh, partly what they attribute a lot of the healing to uh, is is that hot cold hot cold immersive uh, experience. So that is that is also going on here. In Mount Shasta, there's there's also uh, you know as I mentioned before a very very big New Age thing. There's not so much Kundalini here. Uh, Kundalini being uh, you know a a, a force uh, that is recognized, a force that is understood, or a force that is being sought. Um, people here tend to want to deal with more of the physical. And the spiritual that gives them direct physical experiences. So, for instance, uh, uh, you know, doing the sweat lodge. You know, that's kind of like putting yourself into a position where you can detox, but also, you know, have a, a, a visionary experience. So, like you'll see a vision, or you know, some sort of a spiritual-based, in-your-face activity that allows you to recognize and interact consciously with spiritual phenomena. So and I can understand, you know, when I was when I was twenty six, you know, that would have been something that I'd be very interested in too. And so I'm you know, I'm certainly not making a judgment. I'm just basically describing to you uh, you know, what what is going on with folks with regards to how they come to, to Mount Shasta. Um, it's a huge mountain. I think it's uh there's you, you can you can Google Mount Shasta and it'll give you the stats, but I believe it is the second highest peak uh, behind Mount McKinley down there in Death Valley. <coughs> so Mount Shasta does have some very 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 interesting qualities. Um, how many of you would like would like me to take uh, uh, Rosemary on over to the east side and, and see if we can? tie a rope around her waist and slowly lower her into the three million population of Talos under the mountain. How do you feel about that, Rosemary? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I... You didn't get a lot of hesitation there. <laughs> I believe there's also, um, they're, those they're supposed to be tall people, I believe. But I've heard that there's also little people in Mount Shasta, which reminds me of leprechauns and, and the little people of Ireland, but that there are little people there as well, seen apparently. Well, um, there are little people all over the place, not, not just in <laughs> Mount Shasta, uh, but maybe on that eastern side. It's fairly undeveloped on the east side uh, of, the, of the mountain. And so most of the disappearances of people take place on the east side of the mountain here. And these disappearances, you know, they're, they're, they happen every year. People just disappear, and they don't know why. Uh, and so, of course, you know, you get the, the, oh, they've gone down to Talos, or, oh, they've been abducted by E.T., or, oh, this, or, oh, that. And, and, uh, <laughs> Our teachers, you know, Putting students over the side with a rope. <laughs> <laughs> jokingly, jokingly, of course. Of course. Right, Rosemary. Yes. <laughs> she's she's rather adamant that she doesn't want to go into the case. And, uh, that's okay. That's okay. I don't necessarily need to lose student. I don't have that many students anyway. So. <laughs> Mind going in? I want to make sure he got out. Well, well, there you go. There you go. There you go. Now, I have uh, interviewed people who I have a very good reason to believe uh, that they have been, they have had their fetuses abducted out of their body and brought it into Mount Shasta in order to be grown or to be nurtured by E.T. Uh, uh, for whatever, whatever reason they would have and this woman I talked with she you know she was shy about it she didn't want to talk about it it was something that uh, that was very distressing for her um, can you hear me 
Yes. Ah, good. So she told me, she basically said that, you know, the ETs would wait until uh, her husband and her developed a child. They would wait until the child was in the third or fourth month of the uh, pregnancy, and then they would evacuate the child from her body. One time she was taken with the child to see where they were going, and she immediately recognized Mount Shasta and, uh, you know, these, these doorways into the, into the side of the mountain uh, on the east side. So, you know, I have no reason to disbelieve her. She had no reason to lie to me. Her husband didn't believe any of this. It was just her, and it was just a knowledge that she had because, you know, uh, as, as, as many men may not understand, it's, it's like uh, women. I think when they're you know when they're pregnant and you know they're very sensitive to certain scenarios, and and uh, I think that her sensitivity was allowing her to to participate to some degree with what was happening to her fetus, and so. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put too much uh, uh, credence to her husband disbelieving her simply because it's not happening to him. It's happening to her. So she told me about that, and this was after I'd already had my UFO experience on the side of the mountain, but I didn't really have, but happens maybe around me there. And uh, and so it made perfect sense to me, and it still does. It still does. A lot of people have seen lights flying around the mountain. And these are not helicopters, okay? They're not making noise. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and so when you climb the, the mountain, I, I took – I what I did is I, I came to Shasta and I kind of wandered around town a little bit. I went to a bookstore called The Golden Bow, which I don't think is here anymore. And I asked, I said, Where's a, wh- what's a good way to, to climb the mountain? And, and she gave me the very helpful response, which was, well, you just walk around the base of it, and when you feel good, start going up. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for that very helpful instruction. Uh, so what I did is I just got in my car, and I just kind of drove as far as I could, and then there's this parking lot, and then you get out of the parking lot, and you start going up what evidently turns into the Heart Ridge Trail. And this trail takes you really straight up the mountain, and, and it's a ridge. You're, you're definitely walking on a ridge, and it takes you straight up the mountain into into the glacier. Well, you know, I, I didn't have those, those crampons, so I couldn't go all the way. But as you walk up there, it's very, very beautiful exceptionally beautiful and and if you're a sensitive spiritual psychic person you will feel the levels of entities that are there the the qualities of the entities you'll feel a lot of native american energy up there you get beautiful beautiful views you can see the satellites uh going by uh very clearly and uh if you're a little bit out of shape you also might have a little bit of oxygen deprivation so if anybody listening is planning on climbing Shasta make sure that that uh that you don't have a problem with uh with thin oxygen at say the 10,000 foot level now i've skydived at 16,000 feet so i know that that for at least for me breathing at 16,000 feet is not a problem of course, you know you're falling 220 miles, a, uh, you know, an hour. But, but you know, I was breathing as I was, you know, free falling there. You know, after I jumped out of the airplane, and it wasn't a bad, wasn't wasn't a, a problem for me at all. So I, I know that I'm good for Shasta. But for some, it might be. And so if you do have that kind of a medical condition or you have a lung problem, just be be advised that it, it's a high mountain, it's a high peak. It is not just because we speak of it so casually. Boy, let me tell you, when you get there, it's a big mountain. It's a big peak. So be advised of that. Um, right now, the glacier is just kind of being whittled away by the drought, and, and uh, you know, the, you, you, <laughs> you may not need crampons in another month or two. We'll see how this glacier holds up under this drought in California. Um, if anybody would like to... Am I... 
I'm calling in on the guest call in line, huh? You are, but um, I give out the guest call in number if anybody would like to ring in and I mean speak with Chrism about any aspect of your Kundalini awakening. It doesn't just have to be about Mount Shasta. The number is um three four seven nine three four zero zero two six. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh and, and there are multiple lines so that you can call in. I'll still talk, but you can you can call in even though I'm on this line. You can call in, and uh, we have Marilyn listening. We have Eileen listening, and I want to say hello, Eileen. Hello, Marilyn. Uh, thank you for calling in, and Marilyn, uh, it's a it's a pleasure to see your your name down there listening too. Ah, you can uh, see the studio then. That's good. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm in the studio, but but I but I don't have a Skype option. I don't know why. They say uh, just yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Anyway. So when you when you come with your kundalini in the in the presence of the mountain, there's a lot of energy here, a lot of, and you can feel it. And levels of emotion and levels of the, the first responders to energy in your in your body, especially uh, a higher form of energy in your body, will your emotions will begin to pick this up. Uh, you'll have levels of anxiety. You'll have levels of, of uh, maybe hyperactivity and maybe some hyperactivity in your emotional body as well. So you always want to be aware of that. You always want to be aware of that. That's very important that you understand that. Uh, and this will last for as long as you're here. Okay, and so... Levels of anger, lo- levels of anxiety, levels of fear, levels of, uh, of uh, you know, any other kind of an emotion that's near and dear to you uh, can surface. And you just need to know that and, and hold that close to your, to your understanding so that, that other people around you don't take the brunt of that, as poor Rosemary did earlier. Uh, you know, you just need to really understand the amount of, of uh, amplification that can occur here at Mount Shasta. And also in Yosemite, uh, Yosemite is this way as well uh, for different reasons, but Yosemite also has this quality. Not so much the Grand Canyon, that although that's exceptionally grand, and, uh, and but here in Shasta, you definitely have the energetics going full on. And and whether that's coming from Talos or, or whatever it may be, uh, I certainly don't see it coming from the masters of the divine ray, uh, Joshua David Stone's outfit. Uh, I think they teach very good ethics and morals, and I've looked into their schools and things like that to see where people are coming from. And they have a guy now... Because cause Joshua David Stone has passed on, and and another man has kind of picked up his mantle, and his name is Doctor Pillai. And he once again, you know, it's all about channeling. It's all about uh, taking your your orders from some entity that's calling itself Saint Germain or Maitreya, you know, Lord of this ray, Lord of that ray. You know, I'm not, once again, so, I mean, you guys all kind of know how I feel about that. But there's a lot of people here who are doing that. So as they come here and as they collect here and as they as they exude that vibration or that 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 energy, you know, so you can pick that up fairly clearly. And, and it's also, you'll, you'll see as you walk down the little town here, there's a few of the shops that are open and they have, you know, um, uh, Lord this or that, or Lord, you know, of this ray, or, you know, um, Saint uh, uh, Saint this or that of that ray. You know, it just kind of goes ad infinitum. And they, they've been the most productive, I should say, of those that have been to Mount Shasta. So that school, you know, they've got thousands of people that go there, and, you know, they're all communicating with however it works. Um I kind of listened a little bit to Dr. Pillai. He was speaking at a conference that I was invited to speak to. And, uh, you know, he's he's got a very good way of 
explaining his system in a very linear way, you know, kind of like mathematics, but it all really just comes down to channeling and uh, and doing, you know, what the entities that are in your head channeling tell you to do. Basically, that's that's what it's all about. Uh, and so you do run into this up here. And then, of course, you have the other side of that coin, where, you know, people, they just live up here. They lived up here their whole lives. They're a very pragmatic, pioneering kind of people. Uh, they don't believe in pretty much anything unless you can prove it to them scientifically. And so you have, you know, that is probably uh, one of the larger percentages of the population up here. Uh I like going out at night, and I like feeling the energies at night because I don't see the darkness as being something that is evil. Uh, those are those are qualities that humans uh, lend the lack of light. But uh, tonight, you know, I will take a short walk around, depending on the uh, on how Rosemary's feeling and and whether or not I, you know, I have <laughs> lost anything more. Uh, so, you know, I might be feeling some of those energies tonight. Um, but yeah, yeah, having Kundalini and being here in Mount Shasta is great. It's great. All right, Rosemary's making noise. <laughs> she doesn't realize that the rental car has now been turned into a radio studio. <laughs> it's having a heart. Do you want to go into the cafe? You want to go into the cafe? Okay, all right. So, uh, so she's just like sitting still and listening, and and uh, it's not the easiest thing, I'm sure, to to listen to my voice as sonorous and monotone as it can get. I feel the rosemary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for anybody who wants to call in, the call in number is three four seven nine three four. Zero zero two six. Uh, we're about an hour in the program now, and, and I'm not going to talk for the entire uh, two hours. I just want you to, um, uh, with regards to uh, being here in Shasta, it's also nice to go to a place that has the level of of uh, freedom to believe as you choose. Here in Shasta, because the mountain carry so much mysticism with it that mystics are okay here now yes yes the scientific people will you know they'll they'll laugh at them and you know you got the people here that are wearing the the tin foil triangular pyramidal hats so that the aliens don't tap into their thoughts and hey you know for all i know that could work just great uh i haven't tried it I haven't tried it. Uh, maybe I'll have Rosemary try it later on. We'll get us some tinfoil. Uh, but uh, you get the freedom to believe and to be spiritually as you choose to be. And I really like that about Mount Shasta. Mm-hmm. Mount Shasta has that quality. Um, Santa Cruz also has that quality. And various places around the world have a, the ability to just let you be as you choose to be, as long as you're not hurting anybody else. Who cares? So, you know, Mount Shasta would be a place where you could say, oh, yeah, I'm Kundalini Awakened, and, and people wouldn't bat an eye. They would say, oh, how's that going for you? <laughs> without knowing without knowing what they're asking. So, yeah, yeah, it's really good. It's really good to 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 be here, to be within that freedom. I'm going to take Rosemary around later on this evening. I'm going to take her around to some of the shops and things that are that are uh, available here and uh, maybe pick up something uh, for her friends and relatives. And, and uh, you know, I'll look around. I've been in the shop quite a few times, and so there's probably nothing I'm going to pick up unless you or Eileen want something. Do you want something? Me? No, Chris, and thank you very much. Unless you see something and go, perfect for Amelia. <laughs> Do you know what I what I love about about Chasta though as well is there there's a mystical light there. It there's a quality of light there that reminds me of the light here in Ireland. Um and I haven't seen that in many places, but I saw it in Chasta. It's 
there's a quality of light there and that's not even up the mountain you can you can sense that and see that visually and um, and i believe that there's amazing sunsets and things there as well and and i'm just wondering chris and i don't know if this is right but i remember reading somewhere maybe this is connected to those people you were talking about and um, that there's supposed to be this purple kind of a pyramid going right up from Mount Shasta that connects us all into the galactical blah 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 is that the thing is that the ray I don't know anyway oh, oh I see I see uh well you know people can make up any any yeah. stories they want that will you know they and this is this is happening here in Mount Shasta quite a bit people people want a certain thing to 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 be or to appear or to exist. And so rather than wait for that to come naturally, they'll just kind of say, oh, it's here already. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Chris, this is a lot with, with the, you know, the, the people that are, that are doing that school, the, the, the Dr. Pillai, Joshua yeah. Davidstone, um, you know, they, they, they want uh, St. Uh, this or that to appear to them. And so, no matter what, no matter what occurs, I mean, it could be Satan's minion dressed up as a as, as Saint uh, Germain, and you'd be going, Ah, my people, yes, I am Saint Germain, and I have come to give you instruction on how to live your life. <laughs> and entities do hide, don't they, behind? They love you know. that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. yeah. Now, it's, they're not I, all bad. Yeah. And I want I want to make that clear. There, you know, not all entities are bad. It's just the ones that want to possess you. I have I a question actually from from Andrew, if I may. He's in the chat room. Hi, so Andrew. Can I, can I read it out to you, Chris? You ready? Sure. Okay. So he says, "Hi, everyone. I have a question for Chris. It has come to my attention that I have an entity which is attached." To a knot in my throat chakra. I am trying to clear this entity and the blockage. Could you please send me your healing energy and talk a bit about this topic as it's the first time I've ever dealt with it. Blessings and well, gratitude. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, I, I'm going to shoot back another question to you and I'm going to ask you, who told you that you have an entity in your neck? And why do you believe them? I'm waiting to see Andrew is typing. As soon as he has that done, I'll tell you. All right, all right. Very good, very good. Yeah, uh, entities love to possess people, some, some of the lower entities. Here's the deal. Human bodies are, are very dense. They have high degrees of density. And they also have high degrees of light within them. A, a human being is a light-bearing creation. Okay, we exude and we give off a lot of different light. Uh, some of it's visible, most of it's uh, not visible. Uh, we give off heat, we give off light, we give off uh, many different frequencies of energy. Okay, uh, as you know, and we're in this agreement that we we have to forget our reality uh, that we had before we took this human this human body this. This, this experience of being with five senses, maybe a few more, and uh, and living living on this world the way we we live, uh, as you as you pass on, as you go through death, well, you 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 go through those lower lower dense planes of the spiritual level, and these are the these are the levels where you have demons, where you have. Uh, entities that are trying to possess you, and if you have any kind of a handle that they can grab onto, well, they will. Um, as you as you go further up the uh, the ladder, uh, well, you don't run into those type of, of possessing uh, entities so much anymore. You uh, you uh, you have entities there that are far more uh, advanced in their in their spiritual understandings. Uh, so. For the most part, the people that are channeling entities are pulling from these lower astral areas, and it's not 
a healthy combination. And the scenario is this. If this entity is so happy and so willing to serve humanity with the, I mean, out of the goodness of their heart and the, the mass of love, and, and I'm going to emulate some of these entities, ah, yes, dear ones, yes, I am here to, you know, to give you everything you've ever wanted. Um, you know, if, if they're so anxious to do that, well, let them be born of a human mother. And let that advanced soul inhabit a flesh body. And let that advanced soul, you know, help humanity from the inside out rather than just dipping into the mind, possessing that human, and, you know, trying to control all the other humans around them by virtue of possession. This is not a good plan. And let's not kid ourselves. Channeling and possession are extremely similar. They're not exactly the same, but they're very, very, very similar. And I do not recommend that people channel entities at all. I don't want you to channel anything. I don't care if it's your ancestor, your great aunt Jean, or your great uncle Frank, you know, who's passed on. It's like, oh, Amelia, I have some information for you, you know. You don't need that, and you don't need that information either, because it's typically not. It's not going to be Aunt Jean or Uncle Frank. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Chris, and will I read? I, this is what Andrew has said. Yes, yes. Okay, so he says, two different people that are very close to me, and I feel this to be true. That would be two people have told him. It doesn't feel to be harmful, but just attached to me through some childhood trauma, I'm healing. This blockage has been there as long as I can remember since my awakening. I don't think it's harmful, but I think it's time to move on. Also, my Kundalini has been working on this block for two years through Kriyas and Kundalini-driven yoga. Thank you again. Well, they just let the Kundalini clear it out. You surrender to the Kundalini. And if the kundalini is is working on this issue, then it needs to be worked on. And it needs to be worked on at the pace that it is being worked on. If this is not a harmful entity, then you can just chalk it up as a parasite. There are parasites to go around, believe me. Just like the human scalp has so many different species of parasite within it and that we live in peace, with those parasites, well, so too will we live in peace with many of the the different spiritual, energetic forms of creation that will attach themselves to a chakra or a limb or your energetic field in general and and begin to to subsist from off of that energy. Okay? Uh, You don't need to do anything other than surrender to your kundalini. If, you're, if you feel that your kundalini is aware of it, then you have no worries. You have no worries at all. And you don't need to do anything with it. Okay. And if it's a blockage, then perhaps it is something for you to recognize and to fix whether there is an entity there or not. Sometimes a blockage has nothing to do with an entity, even though an entity is present. You know, and immediately we'll blame the entity. Oh, that entity is causing a blockage. When in fact, the blockage truly resides with us. You know, and you're talking about a blockage in your throat. So where are you not communicating with yourself with regards to Kundalini? Where are you not communicating with the Kundalini? Where are you not communicating... Uh, with God, with your idea of God, your feeling of God. Where are you not communicating? What's going on? What are you hearing? What are you saying? What words do you use to express yourself? How do those words begin to form your reality? Basically, words are just extensions of thoughts. So what thoughts are you having? 
about your kundalini, about your neck? Are you are are you are you truly willing to put all the blame on an entity that two of your friends say that are there? Many times, kundalini will allow an entity to stay on a person simply because the presence of that entity is given to teach that person a very specific and a very personal lesson. I have students right now that that that, that have, gosh, you know, a, 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 more than one entity tying into their system. Okay, and there are very and if your kundalini allows this to happen, well, there are very specific reasons and very specific lessons for you to have. But you've got to stick with the morality. You've got to stick with the ethics. If your ethics are weak, and and uh, that entity can begin to to consume uh, that weakness based upon your ethical weakness, then then you're in for trouble. You're in for trouble. But if your ethics are staying strong, if your morality is staying strong, if you if you are able to 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 have the the honesty and the truthfulness and the dignity that that your condition of of having kundalini uh, demonstrates, well then you'll do fine. You'll do fine. Just look at the lesson that is generating in your fifth chakra. And let's remember, fifth chakra deals with uh, kind of like. Ears, nose, and throat. If you look at the, the ENT of, a, of the allopathic uh, medical systems. Ears, nose, and throat. Okay, and partially the eyes as well. Yeah. Uh, Amelia, did you say something? No, Chris, no. Oh, okay, I thought I heard it. Okay, and, and so ask yourself, Andrew, these questions. And another thing I want to really look at is why are you depending on others to see what is attached to you? Why aren't you just looking and making your own uh, considerations? And yes, I know, I know you don't have a lot of experience here. But you have the kundalini. Why aren't you just asking the kundalini? People are fallible. People can mistake, uh, uh, you know, uh, an, an, an entity for just an energetic parasite. You know, an energetic parasite, you know, they're just like, they're just draining certain amounts of energy from the body. I mean, it's, it, you know, typically it's not a big deal. you got more than enough energy in your kundalini to make up for it. And so just like the, the, the parasites we carry in our scalp and in our, in our digestive tract and, you know, in various areas of the body, of the physical body, so do we carry these energetic entities as well. Some of them I call flesh divers, D-I-V-E-R-S. And they'll just jump in and they start riding the energetic uh, circulatory system. Okay. So this is, this is something that, Andrew, I'd like you to look at is, is do your best to self-discern. I would like you to really begin, because you set up this, I think you're the guy that set up the page on Facebook and all of that. Uh, learn to discern for yourself vis-a-vis -vis your kundalini. Trust the communication that you have kundalini. Excuse me a moment. So trust the kundalini. It knows you better than you know yourself, and it certainly knows you better than your friends do. You know, your, your friends, you know, all blessings to them, and I'm sure they're, 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 they're giving you the best that, that they can give, but the scenario is that they don't know. They're guessing. You know. You feel it. But now, now because you, you've taken that, that information from them, and now you're sculpting a reality where, yes, indeed, this entity is causing the blockage. Well, what aspects of the blockage are you experiencing? 
What is it causing you to focus on? What is it causing you to think about? What is it doing to your ethics and morals, if anything? These are the questions, Andrew, that I would, I would suggest you ask yourself these questions. And don't ask it through the, the auspices of another person. Go into meditation. Go into a nice, deep, stillness meditation and ask it yourself and see if it is not something that the Kundalini has placed in you in order to help you achieve a certain level of understanding. Like I said, Kundalini will allow people to have entities sometimes. And then they'll get very specific instructions based upon what those entities are there to teach. And it's not one and one equals two. Or, you know, meiosis is an aspect of cell division. It's not like those kinds of teachings. Okay, it's a spiritual teaching. You will feel it. You will have an intuition about it. These are the muscles that a person needs to really become uh, more aware of and more appreciative of within uh, their spiritual inner climate, their inner environment. Okay? I hope, I hope I've helped you a little bit with that, um, Andrew. A few moments ago, um, he typed in, perfect. I agree completely. I also feel that it is just a parasite. I will trust in the Kundalini. And yes, I am the guy with the page on Facebook. My friends are just concerned. They mean well. And I agree that the entity is there to help me face and clear some karma. I needed to hear the words you have spoken, and I will use my discernment. Oh, wow. Well, that's that's very good. That's very good. And, and uh, yeah, I mean... Now, now, if it was scaring you, or if it was a, if, if it was one of the tall hat guys, they, they, you have these these terror based entities that wear tall pointy hats. It's, it's hard to describe them without laughing, which is not the image they want to project. <laughs> so, if you ever see them, if you just start laughing, they'll go away. Um, yeah, if it's cause, you know, if the entity or the or the blockage is causing you to be violent or to have severe personality changes, which I don't see happening with you, Andrew, uh, then, then something else needs to be done, and there are ways to, to take an entity out of you. If you read any of the shamanic texts, you can take them out with a quartz crystal, but it has to be a long, at least four-inch long quartz crystal, double-terminated, flawless. Flawless meaning it has no uh, inclusions or cracks or, you know, it was it was basically uh, taken out of the earth in in a very, very, very perfect uh, condition. And then the entity can be taken in from the body and into that crystal, and then the crystal is is placed over an alcohol flame, and that entity is released into their next um, uh, journey. So, So that's one way that entities can go, and another way is just, for me, if I just look at them, and if they don't have any reason to be there, then they'll go because they know I can see them. Okay, I'll just look at them. Um, but many, many cases of Kundalini entity interaction, the Kundalini is there, and the Kundalini being the conscious force that it is, will look at that scenario and go, hmm, what can Chrisom learn from this? Let's see. Okay, he'll think that he's possessed. He'll think that he'll have all this fear. Oh, he can he can get over his fear. Oh, he can develop his intuition. You know, oh, he can do all of these positive things, and it's only because he's feeling that outside force, which I'm allowing him to feel. Well, this is a good thing for him. We'll let this continue. Perhaps... Perhaps that conversation is taking place for you as well, Andrew. And, and for many of, of those those of you who are listening uh, in the future in the archive, archives, I'd like to, to say hello to everyone who's listening in the archives. And, and uh, don't, don't push so much fear about the entities. I mean, granted, a possessing entity can be a very fearful thing, and, and I understand that totally, completely. Been there, done that, right? But the scenario is, the truth of the situation is that you have nothing to fear. You have the Kundalini. 
Now, if you pay attention to what the Kundalini is teaching you, and you, and you, uh, well, then that entity will probably go away. Okay. So know this and and, and understand this and realize that you're you're in really the best hands you could possibly be in. <laughs> you're in the hands of the divine. The divine is just allowing you to feel what it's like, the entity. Okay. And it's just, you know, it's very similar to having a zit. <laughs> I hate to be so blunt. Having a zit or a boil, you know, you feel that presence on the skin. You feel that presence in the muscles. And you just want to get that release over with. Uh, and I know some people like to take a really long time with it, let it go just the way, when and how and where it wants to. And, and then there, there are those of us who just, don't mind uh, helping that journey along a little bit. So, so you know, look at it like that. Make sure your ethics and your moralities are intact. High ethics, high moralities, and permission uh, from people that you work with. Okay, if you're using Kundalini, in you know, or your your Kundalini is reaching out to them, whatever, and they know about it. Da, 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 da. If they don't know about it, you don't need to say anything. Okay? So, yeah, yeah. Now, in the half hour that we have left, I would invite anybody to call in at 347-934-0026. Um, if I don't get a caller in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to go ahead and terminate this this broadcast. And I want to, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Amelia Centara for covering me while I was late. Um, I would like to thank Eileen and and, uh, and Rosemary for putting up with me in the various ways that they have. I would like to thank uh, all the people who are there on the chat group that I can't see that are listening to this. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining us here. I, I was kind of curious to see whether or not I could do a show from Mount Shasta, and it seems to be that we can. We can. It's just that... Uh, Maybe I need another, like a laptop or something. So Andrew says, Chrism, I feel completely at peace, and I have no doubt that everything is going along as it should. Thank you for talking this out with me. And a big oh, you're, smiley face. <laughs> yeah, you're more than welcome, uh, uh, Andrew. I mean, the, the, the grace and the love that will come through you will affect many, 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 many people. So make sure you just focus on those qualities of, of grace, love, forgiveness, tolerance, patience, honesty, truth, uh, compassion, sympathy, and, and find your strengths in those areas and let your kundalini amplify those, those areas within you. And I want to say thank you to, once again, to Amelia Centara, to Eileen Laurel. Um, I would like to thank... Uh, Rosemary, who is snoring and sleep right next to me right now. Um. <laughs> we have we have um we have a caller with a question for you, so I'm going to put sure. Carolyn through to you now. Hello, Carolyn. Hey, Chris. Um, I'm curious when you when you say when you're in the hands of the Kundalini, you're safe. You're in the hands of the divine. I thought everybody is in the hands of the divine. I really. Yeah, to some degree they are, but uh, you know, to a, to a large degree, you know, the the divine is what helps us to to uh, refine ourselves to the point where we can have the kundalini and become awakened physical divine uh, ent- you know people, the divine flesh, the flesh that is made divine, as the Bible states. Not that I find everything in the Bible correct, but I do certainly find that to be correct. Uh, Kundalini, there is a far more overt presence of the divine within a person. You're not on automatic pilot, so to speak. People who are going through the refinement processes that I'm sitting right next to here in in in, uh, in uh, Mount Shasta, California. You know they're they're living their life. They're 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 greeting their their challenges and and they're they're doing their best the best that they can or they're not doing the best that they can at all. I mean, the, 
you know, there, there's a whole level of of uh, refinement protocols that are put in place that are automatic for people. You know, and with Kundalini, that changes. It's not so automatic anymore. Because of your refinement, you know, there are certain expectations placed upon the Kundalini awakened person that takes them beyond uh, mundane refinement protocols. It takes them far beyond that. If you're being prepared to have a special skill based upon the Kundalini, well, you better have that refinement down so that you're not using that skill to hurt other people, accidentally or intentionally. Okay. Normal people within that refinement protocol don't have the Kundalini awakened. They don't even have, you know, that special skill to even consider. Their special skill is, you know, gosh, you know, how do I, how do I, uh, you know, succeed in my job, or how do I succeed in my marriage, or what's the best thing to do with raising my kids, things like that. Um, not things of a Kundalini nature. Now, what you say is, Carolyn is right. Is you know, we all have the kundalini at the base of our spine. We all have it. It's there. It's waiting for that refinement process to bring us to the point where it can awaken and it can begin to to infuse our lives with levels of divinity upon levels of physicality. The flesh made divine. The the divine flesh. And and so this is the real difference between having kundalini awakened in a person and a person that is within a refinement process that will eventually take them into a kundalini awakening. Perhaps not in this life, perhaps not in the next ten lifetimes, but eventually they're going to get there. And the kundalini is awakening the skill that they have to do something with? Oh, no, no, well, sure, sure. The, the, the kundalini can, can give that skill. Let's just say it's super strength, you know, the, the, the skill to be able to, to lift a car off of a person or to, to, you know, to have that level of strength and yet have it in a way that, number one, doesn't alert them to the authorities. Oh, my gosh, this guy is throwing cars across the, the field. To, to not scaring people with it. Okay, and so there are whole levels of learnings about very specific special skills that a person will develop with the Kundalini. Not everybody gets the same thing. Not everybody gets strength or healing or whatever. You know, it, it, to a large degree, it, it figures in or factors in with your karma. Karma of a healer, then of course, you know that skill would be, would be given. Um, Kundalini does this, yes. You don't get this without Kundalini, typically. I'm not going to speak absolutely. You know, I'm not going to say absolutely that this can never happen, it's impossible, da 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 I don't speak that way because I know that it's a it's a big universe and, and uh, you know, there's room for all different kinds of manifestations, okay? But within the generalized understanding, the Kundalini will give you the skill and you will need to live up to the special considerations that come along with that skill. You have to utilize it. Well, utilize it. Uh, yeah, sure, that's one thing you have to do, but you have to utilize it in an ethical, moral moral way. Um, morals that, that, are, that are suited to the Kundalini. So these are higher morals, and these are morals that are often beyond the, the ken or understanding of of other people within their, you know, the the automatic refinement system. Your refinement system with Kundalini is no longer automatic. It's conscious. And you have to consciously make the effort to do these things. Consciously control your ego in response to how you would use such a, such a tremendous gift as having super strength. You know, you wouldn't be able to use it in public. You wouldn't be able to self-aggrandize you know, with with that special skill, you won't be able to do that. That will be that's not allowed. It's not about bragging or making yourself, you know, appear more ferocious or bigger or whatever than than the average human being. It's not about showboating or or you know bringing a bunch of attention to yourself. Most of the sit you know the civic skills that I use, I use in secret all the time, but no one ever knows. 
And that's exactly how I want it to be. But what if your anxiety or gets in your way and you you're you're not as conscious about how careful you're pursuing? Well, then you just have to you just have to learn from that, and you have to move forward and make those self corrections. Is it ever too late? And there's no age limit either. As long as you're as long as you're breathing, your heart is beating, and you have the ability to make a choice about yourself, that's all it takes. You don't have to die to 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 make the great changes in life. Death is just a final change for that particular body. Not for the soul so much, but for the body. It's that big change. But you don't need to die to make the big changes that affect your refinement. Uh, you can live. As a matter of fact, you want to live because that's the opportunity to make those changes. Yeah, but under stress, it's hard to make those changes. Well, yes. I mean, I'm not going to say it. it's, 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 it's. What is that, that one book? It's not uh, easy peasy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. And it wasn't for me either. But with more information, with good, honest, truthful information, you can make the best choices for yourself and for your relationship with your Kundalini. You're given that option. You're given that opportunity to make those choices or not. Okay? A lot of people don't know they have Kundalini. And so they live their life knowing that they have this special thing, but they don't know what this thing is, and they don't know why they they go into these things that look like yoga moves, but they do. They just don't tell anyone about it, and they certainly don't tell their MD about it. You know, some of them are smart enough not to do that. Okay, um, there's it's never too late to begin to work with your Kundalini. You just have to start. Make that choice. Make that decision. Start. Say hello. Be, con- be conscious. <laughs> just no. Just say hello to your Kundalini. Do that right now, Carolyn. Say hello, Kundalini. Chris, I'm told you to say hello. Hello, Kundalini. Okay. Now let that be the begin, the beginning of that relationship. If that indeed is the beginning, I don't think it is with you. I think, I think I know who you are, and I think I know that you've been <laughs> working with this for a while. Um, but I don't think that the challenges that you think that you have are the reality uh, that the Kundalini is giving to you. I think that it's giving to you a much uh, better um, health, a, a much better understanding of how life is. But you have to just pull yourself out of any kind of a self-inflicted victim mentality, self-inflicted disharmonious health quality. You have to, you know, you'll get yourself, but many people do this. They get themselves to the point where there's no return. There is no return. The only options are death or believing the kundalini. I'm going to suggest you believe the Kundalini. And you believe the unlimited qualities of transformation that the Kundalini has. And this is a fact. Kundalini is all about transforming the mundane individual to the semi divine. However, that semi divinity is going to land in the person will be up to the Kundalini and to that person's karma. But that is the transformation. And many of these transformations are very similar to what you see other people going through. A lot of people will have the Kriyas. A lot of people will see the entities. A lot of pe- people will have the energy surges going up their spine. They'll, you know, they'll see the, the, uh, the eye of Horus floating in front of them. They'll see the blue eyes. They'll see the lights. They'll see the sun. They'll see all of the different phenomena that come with having the kundalini. But you got to start. you got to trust it. Rosemary was telling me today when I was driving down to, to a gas station, 
She says, well, and I asked her, so well, what, what are you doing? She says, well, I'm just trust. And that was very good. That was a very, very good response. And I would, I would, I would parlay that response into your situation, Carolyn. I would suggest that you begin to really initiate a strong trust and communication in and with your kundalini. Don't listen to your kids. Don't listen to whatever authoritative personnel are, are, are telling you that you have this or you're doing that or whatever. Don't listen to them. Listen to your kundalini. You've come down to a very, very singular level of choosing. And both of them, you know, are, are echoing extreme levels of of interaction with life. I'm going to suggest you make the choice towards Kundalini because there isn't really, uh, really, if you don't, if you don't seize the opportunity that the Kundalini is giving you, you'll wish you had. And you'll come back again and you'll have this again and you'll do it over and over and over until you get it right. I suggest you start getting it right now. How do you feel about that? I don't know how to get it right. Get it right, girl. Because you can. You know that whole idea that uh, they say, I, I don't know if the Bible quotes it or not, it's like God doesn't give you anything that you can't handle, right? That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> well, it isn't true. But you and your kundalini can handle anything. It can handle anything. You just have to not buy into the programs that your mind has been fed by society, by family, by friends. You know, they don't know. Allow them to to control your life based upon their ignorance. They're not bad. They just don't know. They're not at that point yet. Did you cry over your old life that's over? Do you just cry? No. No, you can just smile and, 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 and thank it for its its gifts that have been given. And then you basically take... I mean, you can cry if you want. Cry with joy. <laughs> Tears of joy. <laughs> you can... You can even cry tears of sadness. Oh, I'm going to miss my old life of pain and indignity and lack of communication and lack of trust and lack of self-worth. And You know, you can cry for that if you want. <laughs> <laughs> or you can go, woohoo, finally, I've made it. I suggest the, the latter. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm trying too much. Tears of joy, tears of joy, always tears of joy. You read those safeties. Seriously, read those safeties and remember that that inner joy. And whenever you feel like things aren't going the way that you would want them to go and it's depressing, you just go back to that inner joy and you touch base with that and that's all you'll need. You see, it's not about the medicines that you may be taking. It's not about the psychological reviews that you may have endured. It's not about living up to the expectations of society or your family or your friends or your pets. It's about you and your kundalini. It's about you and your inner divine. And that's all it's about. Now, at this point, Carolyn, that's what it's about with you right now. What if you lost the inner divine and you can't get it back? I'm sorry, what? What if I lost the inner divine and I can't get it back? The thing is, is it's it's really hard to lose the inner divine when it's inner, which means inside of you. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I can't. I can't. I didn't you know, lose it, but I can't. You don't get to lose the divinity. Okay? Divinity doesn't allow you to be lost. Now, you, your ego may feel lost. 
And your ego may not be really happy about how things have been going, but that's just fine. If your ego is unhappy, then you're doing the right thing. (laughs) You're doing all right. If your ego is upset, you're doing okay. Just make sure you stay within the parameters of your ethics and your moralities. Love yourself. Be happy with who you are and how you are. Find that grace within. Just feel those two things right there. And then build that into self-validation. Talk with your kundalini. Feel what it is giving you. And let that feeling and let those understandings be turned into solid knowledge so that you no longer have to fear the unknown because the ego will always fear the unknown. You have a community, you know. Go to Facebook. Go to Yahoo. Go to go to any Kundalini community you you feel comfortable with. You don't have to go to mine. Go to any of them. You know, as long as they're teaching you to be good with yourself and and good with the Kundalini and good with God and and good with change and good with transformation and good with surrender. If they're teaching those things, hey. Nothing, there's nothing wrong with those qualities. No, it isn't. This is good. Thank you. You're welcome, my dear. Absolutely, and thank you for calling. Well, okay, everyone. So, so this is this is this is quite true. I will tell you the exact same thing that I've been 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 talking with Carolyn about. Validate your kundalini. Validate the refinement process that you've had to come through to have this in the first place. Andrew, talking to you here too. You're in the early you're in the early areas of the kundalini, the early symptoms of the kundalini. Now validate that. Find the strength in this new beautiful you that you are becoming. Do not cry for the old self. Do not cry for the old ego that is, oh, my gosh, I can't, I can't be a racist anymore. Oh, my God, I can't be a thief. Oh, my God. You know, don't cry for those qualities. <laughs> be happy. Be happy that you have emerged beyond the control. I would like to thank Glenn Ola for putting together the the uh, Kundalini Awakening Systems One dot com website. I'd recommend anybody uh, to go there who's interested in the Kundalini. I would like to uh, uh, give you the YouTube account number or account name, which is Chrisum dot Kundalini, and uh, we I think there's two hundred and almost three hundred uh, videos there, all about the Kundalini. I would invite you to go there. I would like to to uh, to let you know that we have Facebooks on Yahoo Kundalini Awakening Systems One Yahoo groups and Kundalini Healing Yahoo groups, and I even have a Tantra group that I'm not doing too much work with on the Yahoo groups, Kundalini Awakening Systems One Tantra. I also have a Facebook of uh, Kundalini Awakening Exclamation Point. Kundalini Awakening Systems 1 on Facebook, uh, a Kundalini Healing on Facebook, and a Kundalini Ashram, which is a very, uh, it's a devotional group where you, 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 are, you are allowed to be devotional uh, to the Kundalini, to the teacher of the Kundalini in a public format that isn't public. It's just amongst the members there. It's a, it's a secret group. So that option is there with you as well. I'd also like you to know that uh, um, I do Skypes with people. And so I do a lot of Skype sessions with people. Um, And then if you're like Rosemary or Eileen or Amelia or many other people that have come to visit me at the ashram, you can come and visit me in Santa Rosa, California. And uh, we'll take you up to Shasta. We'll take you to Yosemite. We'll take you to the Grand Canyon. We'll take you to Los Angeles. Um, or we'll just meditate there at the house. Meditate in the garden. You can experience what it's like to meditate with Lasha, 
wanting to, to <laughs> dominate your your attention. Anyway, I thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Amelia, for hosting it, and Eileen, and Carolyn, and uh, Andrew for for uh, for talking with me about the Kundalini. And I hope to see you next week, same time, same station. I promise not to be late next week. Uh, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Bye-bye.